Hello, people. Mbedoma. That is good evening in my native dialect, Igbo. Ahambo Mwajiaga Omero. And you are welcome to your favorite primetime TV show, Ways. It's our season break special. And as we round off the year and mark our four years anniversary, I want to highlight why I love Ways and the impact it has had on me personally and on my journey onto television by answering 10 personal questions about Waze and how it fits into my life. Well, I would say that the show um, addresses societal issues and concerns and it gives relevant information. And most of the time, what we do is that we focus on communication and exploring different perspectives to different issues. So, um, well, on this, I would say my personal mission is to learn and grow constantly. You know, um, continuously pushing my boundaries and challenging myself to achieve my full potential. And yes, I must say, Waze has been of great help and it has made a difference because um, it helps me to make a difference in the lives of others and also to give back to the society. Okay, on, on, well, on this, I would say the Japa series, um, and that would be the topic on legal routes to uh, migration. Yeah, that one. Uh, oh, well, uh, my day job. Okay, so I'm a head business development and partnerships at um, an IT company called TBO Consulting. Um, well, I like that I'm learning and expanding my knowledge, especially on a daily basis, and this helps to keep me quite engaged. Well, and also constantly I'm being challenged to solve problems, answer people's questions and concerns, complete task in a way that is quite helpful. And when, for me, when I succeed in assisting people, it gives me a sense of purpose and satisfaction. <laughs> well, uh, myself. Uh, well, in terms of, um, I'm proud of myself because in terms of how far I have come, and this would be in different aspects of my life, in my learning, in growing, in helping other people either through information dissemination or just being helpful. Um, achieving set goals, no matter the challenges, building good relationships and being true to myself and making a difference where possible. Well, um, this is a, well, okay. So on this, I would say my fear of the unknown. Uh, why would I say fear of the unknown? You know, that uncertainty about the future can be quite unsettling and it leads to anxiety about things like life, relationships, health, and personal fulfillment, depending on what I set for myself. Well, I would say one major challenge this year has been uh, on the professional side of it. You know, I change, I change jobs and that will require taking on a new responsibility because now I head a, a whole unit and I have a whole team looking, um, looking up to me, um, dealing with different conflicts that will come up and just being my usual go-to solution provider. And it has been quite challenging, but fascinating all at the same time. And I've had the opportunity to learn a lot from it. Yeah. Uh, if I were elected president for one day, what would be my number one priority on my to-do list? Let me say, uh, my proposed number one priority would be to address the issue of corruption. And under that, I would have a few 
set goals. And one of it would, one major one would be strengthening anti-corruption institutions. And this um, includes increasing the capacity and resources for the, um, that's the EFCC, that's the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, and other relevant bodies that would help out in, and also providing them with the necessary trainings and tools required. Another thing I would do in this regard would be implementing systematic um, reforms. And what this would help to do is to improve transparency in government procurement processes. And it will also help to strengthen whistleblowing uh, protection mechanisms. And, you know, introducing stricter sanctions for corruption offenses, because that's the only way you can get people to listen sometimes. Then the next one would be promoting a culture of integrity. And um, what I would do, this would entail fostering public awareness about, you know, the effect of uh, corruption and encouraging citizens to actively participate to fight against it. Well, another one, another uh, point would, I would go, I would concentrate on would be addressing the root causes of corruption, because if we don't address the root causes, then we're just wasting our time. And this would include tackling the major ones, which is poverty, inequality and a weak rule of law because if we had law we had good uh, strong rule of law a lot of things would not go unpunished um, well I would say that the media plays a very very crucial role in national transformation and this is in several ways um, it helps to disseminate information for public, keeping them informed on national issues, government policies, and global affairs. You know, awareness helps to empower the citizens to participate actively. If you don't do that, then they feel like they're left out. So this will help them to participate actively in democratic processes and hold, be able to hold their leaders accountable. And this will help to shape public opinion and influence attitudes towards national issues. So we get more, more interaction. Uh, well, there are several ways I unwind. And I'll just mention a few. I would say um, I love to spend time with my family and friends. I play a whole lot of tennis uh, when I get the time. And I watch movies and I love to travel. Um, so my favorite show this year is the Jabba series, like I mentioned earlier. Um, and the topic we're going to be concentrating on is uh, legal routes to migration. And that's where we discussed with Zeno Ojobo. Um, and she's a scholarship and admissions coach. And we discussed on the issue on some of the legal routes to migrate out of Nigeria. And I know she touched uh, majorly on scholarships and scholarships, what do you expect and how do you prepare? Which one do you go for? How is it going to be funded? Uh, whether it's going to be self-funded or um, you're going to take a study loan from international bodies or institutional scholarships. Because I remember we mentioned, she mentioned that um, and that way, that's where you can get uh, a research-based funding, what, what, what was it called? Re a research-based funding position. And that, um, that would also assist in getting you a grant for students as, and you can find yourself as a student uh, graduate assistant. Yeah, so that would include assisting some of the professors in the university while um, getting the grant so that you'll be able to study also. So um, in case you can't remember this episode, I would play some parts of it for you, and I'll see you soon. All right, <laughs> thanks for staying with us. Now, illegal migration in Nigeria is a complex issue driven by poverty, economic disparity, political instability, and lack of access to education and opportunities. Migrants without credible information face significant risk, including exploitation, abuse, and harsh conditions. 
illegal migration also puts a strain on the host country's resources and, of course, and leads to brain drain in Nigeria. Now, addressing illegal migration requires tackling root causes, strengthening border security, promoting legal uh, migration pathways, fostering international cooperations, and protecting migrants' rights, amongst others. So tonight we're asking, what are the legal routes to migrating in Nigeria, right? Now, please, let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 81 Now, you know, this uh, subject is a sore point for Uti yes, because she's anti-Jakpa. But you see, the truth is, the reason we... <laughs> That's, no, now that's you are pro Nigeria. I Let have me put mixed it. feelings exactly. Yes, so. you are actually very pro Nigeria I, because you are somebody that lived in the UK for years, mm. and mm. you still decided that you have to come back to Nigeria. So I get you, mm. but the reason we are having this conversation today is that tomorrow somebody will go and enter cargo and says he wants to go to this thing, yeah. or somebody will take a visiting visa and go and stay in another man's country mm. illegally, right? Mm -hmm. Whether we like it or not, illegal migration happens every, every day. single day. So. My point is, instead of us, you know, trying to um, say, why are you doing this? Why don't we teach people better ways of migrating? Mm. How about that? No, I agree. So why I said I have mixed feelings is because um, I don't have a problem with people migrating to acquire knowledge, to develop themselves, to grow. Um, but I would love for there to also be a... Um, is is not repatri is repatriation the right word for live people? I'm not sure. I'd like there to be a return hmm. of that knowledge and, and people um, with a view to improving things and, and making things better here. So that's why I said it's mixed feelings. But hmm. I totally agree. Too many people are jack in the wrong way. So hmm. being able to do it in a legal manner and understanding the opportunities that are there is also very important. So I think that when people... The people who, like our guests, mm. who are helping people to do it the right way Absolutely. are actually very, very valuable because this process is not only sometimes very complex, but it's very expensive. Ha, are you telling me? So anybody that can help you mm. to, one, find a way to reduce those costs, find a way to um, gain, because this also scholarships and things for education. Oh, yeah. Is part of the, it, she's, know, the I said she's the perfect person. Exactly, of gaining <laughs> knowledge. So... Yes, I understand it, but I still have mixed feelings. Yeah, of I mean, she's the perfect guest. And I'll yeah. tell you why, because I, I kind of like monitor her page on social media. And I see that beyond, you see, it's one thing for you to say, okay, these are legal means. A mm. lot of times she presents opportunities that even when you do not have financial, you know, she, she talks a lot about opportunities mm. that are available without you having to pay money. Yeah. You know, you get a sponsorship, you get a scholarship, you know, all of those kind of things. But so quickly, better ways yeah, to do it. absolutely. Okay, mm -hmm. do you so let, let's just bring in our guest now, committed to helping aspiring graduates, school aspirants succeed. Zeno Ojogbo teaches perspective or prospective graduate school applicants, um, graduate school applicants to navigate the complex process of securing scholarships and studying abroad under her tutelage. These applicants have secured over $4 million and relocated abroad alone or with um, their families. Now, Zeno is a scholarship and admissions coach with um, SFM Migration and a PhD candidate, University of Waterloo, Canada. And she's joined us live from the Canada. Thank you so much, <laughs> Zeno, for joining us this <laughs> Thank you. It's good to be here. Thank you so much. Finally. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's good to be here. Fine. You can't, you should have finally. We've been chasing Zeno for over two months. Uh -huh. There you go. <laughs> but I mean, I can understand your schedule is busy, but we had to leave, literally leave the conversation because I don't want us to just have this conversation just with anybody. Right? I mean, so, so first of all, a quick word, right? Tell us um, um, as a as someone that is really passionate about helping people, why did you even start to venture in these particulars? What, what led to this first, before we even then quickly go into, uh, what's it called, the conversation for today? Okay, yeah, so um, I started, it was during COVID, I became active on social media, right? I just started posting on social media, and people see me in Canada, um, they see that I'm in school, and people started to ask the question, like, how did you do this? Like, how are you studying? People know that studying abroad is expensive. And um, I also came to Canada with my son at that time, who was two years old. So people saw this and they started asking me this question, like, how did you do it? How, 
how do you pay your tuition? We know that it's expensive. What do you do? And I started sharing, so I let them know that, yeah, just like you many years ago, I wanted to come to Canada, but I didn't have the money. Like, it's expensive to school abroad. If you are not from a wealthy family, um, an average person can barely afford it. Hmm. So I was like them, I didn't have the money, and um, I like to find solutions to problems. Hmm. But I also remember that after I graduated from the University of Benin many years ago, um, there were some of my classmates that went abroad to study. Like, these were my classmates, so we knew the financial situation of all of us. But if people could go abroad to study, I thought about it like, I know that these people are not from that kind of wealthy family where they can pay tuition. How did they do it? Mm. So I became curious and I started to ask questions. And that was how I found out that, yeah, I knew that there were scholarships. But I also had that mindset that for each scary scholarship, you must have, like, have graduated with the first class. And um, it's not, you know, this imposter syndrome where I felt like, okay, yeah, maybe maybe I'm not good enough for this thing. And maybe mm. it's not for me, right? So, um I just thought that I wouldn't be able to get it. While I was chasing that, I was also trying to um, trying to come to Canada via the permanent, permanent resident, resident route, via express entry. But at the same time, that's a point-based system. My points were too low. It couldn't get me an invitation to apply. Mm. So I was just there doing my thing in Nigeria, though, going to work and trying to see that, okay, maybe things will work out eventually. I don't know how I was thinking that things will work themselves out because it's quite ridiculous for me to think that. But anyways, in 2016, while I was still just hoping that things would work out, I lost my job in Nigeria. Wow. I don't know if you guys remember in 2016 where there was like an economic situation, just like we are in right now. And oil price dropped and companies laid off employees. So I was affected at that time. Hmm. And I'm like, okay, this is my situation of being unemployed. Um, I was living in the lucky axis then um well not lucky phase one in Igwe phone and rent was quite expensive there mm. i'm like how am i going to cope in this country without a job mm. and we all know how difficult it is to get a job in nigeria like <laughs> i i that was when i realized that you know i need to focus on this thing and relocate so that was the motivation that i had mm. and i pushed like i started up at, the, at this time i was unemployed anyway so the only thing that i had to do was to look for the opportunities so i used that time to focus look for opportunities i learned that um universities have scholarship opportunities so don't people think of scholarships like external scholarship like the likes of commonwealth Erasmus Mundus and you know those big scholarships now while those scholarships are very good and they give you good money they are very competitive mm. so I had to look for opportunities that were less competitive to give me more opportunity to be able to secure one mm. and that was when I found the university university based scholarships so these are institutional based scholarships mm. so an example is that when I came to Canada to school in the University of Waterloo my scholarship I was funded by the university wow so what that means is that I cannot decide to say okay I don't school in University of Waterloo again I want to go to University of Toronto mm. I cannot take that scholarship out of the school so like so if you want to, if you want to stick with the scholarship you have to stick with the school exactly so these scholarships they are a lot more easier to get than those big name scholarships which many people focus on and realize that you know they tell themselves that yeah it's not for me hmm. so when i started talking about teaching people on social media then i saw that more people were even interested so that was how uh, my brand on social media came about and since then i've been i've been sharing Awesome, yeah. awesome, awesome. <laughs> Ladies, you want to come in? <laughs> oh. um, well, you, you have a, quite a story. Uh, and very relatable, I must add. Very, because you found the, e like, the easiest way to get what you wanted and you were able to be successful in that because a lot of people have a lot of issues, even when they want, like, what we're talking about, migration. So even, I don't even know how much it costs legally in Nigeria to actually purchase, like, if you legally want to migrate, what the total cost would look like. Mm -hmm. But um, this has brought light to other ways where you don't even have to spend as much. Absolutely. So it's, it's quite enlightening. Mm -hmm. Uti. So, yeah, no, I was going to say, I mean, you touched on something that is really, really key. I think for me, whenever I think about scholarships, what I'm thinking is 
academic um, excellence is the academic side of it right so you touched on that but i think for me it's always what does that journey look like so we've talked about the usual bigger scholarship programs you know you mentioned erasmus you, there's things like chevening if you're in the uk um what are some of the criteria? Because I think you think of academic excellence, but then what does that selection process look like? What does that application process look like? What should I be thinking about? I mean, you know, most people think it's all about having a first class. What if I have a 2-2 or don't even have a, I have a third class? class? What does that look like um, with this particular type of institutional scholarship? Uh, maybe just walk us through that application process. Where do I start? Okay, yeah, so um, the first place to start is to decide how you're going to fund your studies. I see many people, they just rush, go up, apply for admission, and they get admission, and then that's when it dawns on them that they cannot fund it. So you first of all need to make a decision, how am I going to fund my studies? So are you going to use scholarships? Are you self-funding? Are you trying to take um, study loans from like these international organizations that give loans to international students? So let's focus on the scholarship part. When if you decide that, okay, I don't have money, I'm going to try to secure scholarships to fund my studies. These institutional scholarships, they, there are different ways you can approach them, and this is dependent on the school. So for some schools, they want you to like contact like a research advisor or a professor who is going to supervise you for a research-based position. Hmm. So you have to contact that person first, and if the person says, okay, you know what, I like your profile, I want to work with you, it's going to give you a go-ahead to go apply for the admission, and on your on your um, application for your admission, there's a part that says, have you found an advisor, what is your advisor's name, and then you can put that professor's name there. Hmm. Some other schools, they don't want you to find an advisor, they just tell you, you know what, apply, and our advisors will come and pick from the pool of applicants and they pick their students that they want to supervise. So research-based funding, the way it works is like you're going to do a research-based master's or a PhD. These professors, they have grants to do research. So they have research grants and they need students to work in the lab to do this research. And when I say lab now, people may think of a physical place. It could be a physical place or it could be a group of people. So some people, they work on, let's say that their research involves like doing surveys and talking to people. They say, yes, in my research lab, they are referring to a group of people. They don't necessarily have to be in a physical space. But for me, as a chemical engineer, I have to be in a physical space because I do like physical experiments. And when this professor hires you, he now pays you from his research grant for you to work in his lab. In exchange, you do the research and you get a degree. Hmm. So that's how this money comes about. So it could be in form of that research assistantship. Or some schools will tell you, okay, you know what, they're going to help a professor with teaching. So like a teaching assistant where maybe you support, you um, pro proctor exams, you um, mark assignments, mark exams. Or the other, they have another like um, graduate assistantship. Like if you now go to the US as an example, graduate assistantship. Here you can do like a cost based master's or a cost based program so where you don't have to do a thesis. There's no thesis component to it. And then you can get that funding. So they tell you that, yeah, you're going to get tuition waiver plus you're going to get a stipend, but you're going to be doing a job. Maybe you're working as a porter in the hostel or you work in parking services or you work in the library or you work in the IT department. It is, it is so generally they, attached to something. To the school. Mm. Exactly, yes. So it's like they're paying you for what you are doing. So they pay you that money while you chase your degree. And I tell people that, you know, the universities abroad, they cannot run without graduate students. They need the graduate students to do the job. So there are some departments where they keep chasing graduate students. Come, come apply for teaching assistantship. They have to pay, they'll pay you, but they are looking for people to apply. Well, you know, this one is hard, Shao, because me when I study physics, why are they for inside media now? How will I go and do graduate assistant? You know, so <laughs> I, this is a very critical question because you know why? In Nigeria, what you studied, right, it's only very few people that are lucky to be, like, to be working where in the field of study that they actually studied. You see um, doctors now in the bank, or you see, you know, bank turned interior decor. So there's not that link. And if you want to take off some of these kinds of, because I've seen that with, with things abroad, right, they really want to follow your history. 
So if you are doing if you, if you are doing physics or you study physics like like me, they would have ex, they would expect that your work history is aligned with physics. Then if you are going to go and do a master's, it has to be you know like that. So that kind of that kind of clear path is not available. So people that have di probably like digressed in terms of like their career from based on from what they study to what they are doing now, how easy will it be for them to be able to get some of these you know scholarships? Because it's not tied to them. Because I see sometimes it has to be tied to your your first degree somehow. Okay, so this is what we call, we call this an em employed study gap. Hmm. So you have a study gap, but you have been employed in something different. Hmm. Now, again, it depends on how long you have been doing that something different. So if you've been doing it for a while, let's say you've been doing it for 10 years, now you can leverage your work experience to get into a graduate program because the work experience you've earned for all these years if it's, a, it's even more than a bachelor's degree, for example. Mm. So if you have this work experience and you've been doing the job, then you can leverage that. Then many times while we work, like you get certifications, you are building skills, you know, you have like proof to show that you have developed these skills over time. You just have to present that. And mm. this is where application packaging comes in. At the end of the day, it depends on how you present your application. So I tell people that they are the scholarship committee, they are your customers. You, the applicant, you are you are a you are selling a profile. What you sell is your academic profile. The way you market it to the admissions committee is how they are going to take it. So you need to learn how to package your profile and deliver it to them in a way that they are going to choose you amongst all the other applicants. Mm. It's very important. Mm. And many times you do this by telling your own unique story. This is why when I see people selling somebody, you know, come and help me put my application together, help me write my statement of purpose. You are not you are not telling your story. You are going to try to tell somebody else's story, and it doesn't even work that way. Hmm. Okay, you know what? Yeah, I'll come to you, Uti. I know you want to say something. Let's just go out on a very short break. When we come back from that break, I'll come to you, Uti. Stay oh. with us. All right, thanks for staying with us. Now, if you just tuned in, we're having a great conversation with Zeno, and we're discussing. This is a part; it's a series, though. As Zeno has our time, we'll be bringing her again. You know, <laughs> it's uh, it's legal routes to migration. And um, today, we're I think we're just focusing on education today. Mm. Legal routes to migration, and um, that's the conversation. Please, let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to zero eight one eight zero three eight four six six three. Uti. Yeah, so, I mean, when I was listening to you talking about the teaching positions, graduate assistants, all sounds very interesting, right? Now, most times when I think about research degrees, um, they tend to be in the sciences. So let me say STEM or STEM, whichever I was going to say that. Mm. And not everybody has that background, right? Um, so my question is twofold. One, yes. What kind of opportunities exist outside of the usual sciences, STEM, STEAM? And then, you know, when we do these things, let's be honest. The study is a means to an end. So when I go and get a research degree, and yes, they've paid my way for the first couple of years, mm. what next? Hmm. Yeah, um, I, I really like your questions. Yeah, so... Um, Again, it's a myth when people say that there are only opportunities in STEM. That's not true. The opportunities. But well, that's what we hear. <laughs> yeah, but the opportunities in every department: mm. English, mass communication, public health, like any all the social sciences. They have research in all of them, all these fields. So if you can go, just check the website of the university you are going to see that these professors are working and doing research. That's all you need to do. You just need to contact them. If they are professors in that department, then of course they engage in research. So in every field. Now, why is it that a lot of people think that there is more? there are more opportunities in STEM? Just because they, are, they look for people in STEM. So they keep advertising it everywhere because they are looking for qualified students in STEM. And this is what I tell people that, you know, the way international students are looking for funding opportunities, that is the same way professors are looking for good students. Mm. Because they, they can't find, because many people cannot present their profile the way they should present it. So it's like a mutual relationship. Now let's go to your second question of saying what next. 
Um, when I came to Canada in 2017, sincerely, I was already on that. Like, I was trying to come be a permanent resident, but since that was, wasn't working, I decided to pivot to the study pathway. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, what I really wanted was to relocate, like to be able to live permanently. But I used this, I used studying as a pathway to achieve that goal, as a legal pathway to achieve that goal. So while once I graduated from the university in when did I finish my master's? 20, 2019, <laughs> early 2019. I immediately applied for my permanent residence. That same year, I got my permanent residence. Within that time, I was trying to figure out what's next. Like, what do I want to do with my life? As a chemical engineer, um, I was working in the field back in Nigeria. Did I want to go back to the field? Because I'm also a mother. I didn't want to do that. But I also fell in love with doing research. So I decided, okay, if I'm going to go the path of research, I need to get a PhD if I want to grow in that field. So I decided I was going to do a PhD. During this period while I was doing a PhD, I was already working towards citizenship. And early this year, I became a Canadian citizen. So again, like I tell people, like think long term when you're trying to relocate. You want to relocate, you need to think about it. We, we have something where we call choices. That's how we tagged it. Choices is choosing the right program and choosing the right country. So when you are choosing a country of best fit, you're making sure that you're choosing the country that you can relocate to based on your own unique goals and your own unique situation. Mm. So an example is like if you're married, you want to make sure that you are going to a place that your spouse can relocate with you. When they are going to a place that your spouse can walk. Mm. If you have kids, you want to make sure you're going to a place that your kids can live, can go to school without you having to pay additional tuition. If your ultimate goal is to live in that country permanently, then you also want to make sure that there is a path to permanent residence in the country that you are going to. So these are the things that you need to decide while you are, you need to think about while you are making that decision mm. to relocate. Mm. Okay. So, I mean, Zeno, I like where we are going with this conversation. I just want us to bring us back to the original question, right, which is the legal route to migration. And I'm asking, if these options are readily available, like you say, why do we still have a huge number of people leaving, um, uh, what's it called, Nigeria illegally? So I've heard cases of people that have been sent back from the airport because they got to Canada and they said they, that, yes, they are here for holiday, but if they get a job, they'll stay back based on the fact that you can now convert your visiting visa. Like some of all of these things, right? Why do we still have those? I mean, like an entire family was turned back. I, feel, mm. I felt so bad for them because I heard that the man had sold everything. He had, you know, got all his wife, his children, and, you know, at the, at the point of entry, what are you, if you, you say, if I get a job, I will stay. Oh, more, they sent him back to Nigeria, right? So all these little, little things that happen. Why do we still have that huge number of people why are people not exploring this option? Is it that education is really tough or, you know, and, and again, there is the work part, right? Which is the skilled work and the unskilled workers um, um, pathways to migrating. Why are people not exploring these options that are readily available? Why do we still have very high level of illegal um, migration happening around us here in Nigeria? Okay, so the reason why we have that is um, two reasons. I will start from the first one. A lot of people, they don't like to read, they don't want to do research, they don't want to do any work. The second big reason is that this thing, these things take time. Now, the way I'm saying it, it may sound very easy, but it's easy until you start to do it. And it takes a lot of discipline, a lot of effort, a lot of resilience, and you have to be able to handle rejections. Because, hmm. again, think about the number of people in Nigeria, then think about India, think about population in China. All of these people are chasing the limited opportunities. I've not even mentioned people in other countries. So what this means is that the opportunities are, are less than the number of people that are chasing them. So you have to ultimately differentiate yourself if you want to succeed. Now, I see sometimes I post um, scholarship opportunities and I put the link in the caption. Mm -hmm. And on the image of the video, I stated the details in caption. People still comment, where is the link? <laughs> it tells me that they did not read. <laughs> and then people are looking for shortcuts, the easy way out. Sometimes the amount of money, time, efforts people spend chasing shortcuts 
they would have spent less if they had actually gone the right way mm. to just do it. But people are chasing shortcuts. They don't. They don't want to work. They when people come and they deceive them that you know yes when you just get to Canada you just go in your your work permit is inside your visit visa. So it has a lot of ridiculous things and mm. um. People want to hear, they like to hear what they want to hear. And when you tell them that these things are not easy, be ready to put in the work. They don't want to do it. Some people will come and tell me, you know what, Zeno, you do it for me. I'm in my final year of my PhD. I stayed up until 2 a.m. last night applying for funding opportunities. Mm. And I tell people that the number of funding opportunities that I've applied for in my lifetime, it's a lot. And I was a very broke student and I just couldn't remain in that situation. I, I didn't want to live from hand to mouth with my child, looking at my child and we don't have enough. I had to start applying for scholarships. And from doing those applications and hand dealing with many rejections, I now got to a point where it, for every scholarship I applied to, it became easy. So I got the university scholarship. I got the Ontario government scholarship. I got the Canada federal government scholarship. So I got to a point where everything that I applied to, I just got. But it took a lot for me to get there. I did not graduate to the first class. So people will not be saying that, yes, you know, she must be very brilliant and whatnot. In fact, my CGPA was a three point out of five. So it's not like I was not top in my class. I would, I'm just, I just want to put it there so that people can understand that, yeah, it's not because she's too intelligent. But I hustle. If they say that there is this thing that is available and there's a legal way to get it, I would learn how to do it. I would practice doing it. I would do it until I become an expert in doing it until I can get it. And I would not give up along the line. But many people, when they do it once, they'll be like, you know what? It's not working. And then, so this is the reason why you see people going short court, looking for illegal routes. They don't want to work. They don't want to do anything. It's not, it's not easy. But at the end of the day, if you are diligent to put in the work, it's worth it. <laughs> so, so this is what I say, right? <laughs> and thank you so much for telling your story in such a real and very relatable way. Mm -hmm. This is what I often say on the show. Who will make it, will make it. The tenacity that you have, the drive that you have, you made a decision, right, to take the route to Jakba and better yourself. I want to bet that if you had stayed in Nigeria, yes, you were going through a tough time at that point. You would still have succeeded. But you would still have succeeded. Because this tenacity, you would have put your hand into the something energy, yes. else. And you would have done well. And that's what I always say. That is not a magic formula. There's no magic pill. There's no silver to bullet. To success. Right? If you are going to put in the work, it will take time. Yes, the time frame is different for everybody. But the reality of it is, if you dig in and you dig deep, it will pay off. Absolutely. The fact that people don't want to do the work, we like to throw money at things. And that's why we end up in the hands of people who take advantage of us. Because yeah. they just tell you, bring $10,000. They will hustle for a short term. Because I just need this $10,000. Everything will just add up. And then you get abroad and you realize that you've been taken for a ride. Mm. Whether it's a tourist visa, that, and that's the thing for me. So, I mean, like I said, I have very mixed feelings about this topic, but me personally, I applaud you for shining light on what hard work it takes because people need to understand that. Absolutely. I was, I was just going to add to, to, to what Uti said because, you see, sometimes when we hear these things, you know, and, and, and it's important that the conversation was, is, is, is as real as it is, right? When people hear these things, they just think there's a magic wand. They just do it like this. Once you just enter Canada, you know, you know. There's money on the street. Yeah. <laughs> but hearing you speak, right, they, even within the fact that you're still doing the PhD, you're still, I mean, you were up till 2 a.m. Come on. Somebody goes, say, wait till you define yourself. You get? Mm. But so, so now, how do we address the issue about mental laziness? Because there's this, there's the mental laziness that people are not want, willing to just, you know, Get it, go and help me do it. And that's why you said it's true. They fall victim of, of scammers, right? Scammers will just tell you that, don't worry, with 2,000 uh, pounds, I can get this for you. With $50,000, I can get this for you. And they, they fall victim of it. How do, we, how do we start to tell people what is important if somebody's watching now? Why is it important for us to rise above that mental laziness in this journey if you truly want to migrate legally? Why is it important? Yeah, it's important because you would not be able to achieve anything if you are mentally lazy. And even the people that throw money at things, and let's assume that they throw money at it and they succeed, you see them, they relocate abroad and they remain in the bottom pot, like they are always at the bottom. They cannot grow because they cannot learn 
They cannot read information. They cannot um, research. They cannot navigate the system. So, you know, sometimes I post certain things on my page. Like when I tell people that, you know, I secured over $400,000 in scholarship, so people come and tell me, you're a liar. You are this and you are that. I don't even pay them any attention because some of them will claim that I've been in this country for 100 years. You know, it doesn't work that way. When I see people make those kind of comments, I can tell that these are the mentally lazy ones and they are unable to navigate the systems for them to succeed because they can't do anything. So it is very important that you rise above the mentally laziness because you would not succeed in anything if you continue that way. So if you know that um, you want to grow, you need to start from somewhere. Tell yourself, you know, I'm going to read this thing for five minutes. Even me, sometimes I get bored of reading certain things. Like I will, sometimes, if it's not interesting to me, I don't I don't want to read it if it's not interesting. But there are some things that I know that I have to read. Hmm. And what the strategy that I use to help myself is that if I say I'm going to do something and I put aside ten minutes to do it, and I don't feel like I feel bored, like I'm tired, I, I don't want to do it. So I'm going to punish myself for ten minutes doing nothing. Hmm. So these ten minutes that I'm saying I'm going to use to read this paper, if I'm not reading that paper, I will not take my phone. I will not watch YouTube. I will not do anything else. So let let me stay in that boredom. The boredom is going to push me to do the thing that I said that I would do, so I can release myself. <laughs> what do you know? You also you get ready to get that blood for your blood. I can't. <laughs> Your blood, <laughs> yeah. we, this one, this one, the case of we died here. Nothing did they happen. Well, I mean, this is at all. What are you going to carry last? Let's take a comment quickly. Uh, okay, this comment is from Daniel Elo. Good evening, my beautiful uh, sisters of what are you saying? Hashtag ways. Uh, Japa series, legal routes to migration. Japa is a means whereby someone relocates to another country because of hardship. According to our sister, our beautiful guest, she made mention of relocating to the right country, not only relocating because of relocating sake. I am on the same boat with my dear beautiful sister Uti. I am against Japa. I am also in support of it. Why am I against it? Because it's stressful. Why am I not? Uh, why am I in support of it? Because there is no option and choice. The only way out is to Japa to avoid further suffering and hardship. If we have to Japa, let us go to the right country in order to avoid regrets. Um, nice having you back, Sister Uti. I missed you. God bless you. <laughs> My name is Daniel. Ito. Hello. I mean, regular fan. absolutely. We are the final yeah. word for Zino. I, well, I, I you haven't said much. Oh, you think Yeah. The last time we spoke about it, and it was very passionate from the angle we... Yeah. Did, but Zino has put too much light into, into it. I'm telling you. It's, it's brought, it's brought a, a, a glaring light, light to a whole different new perspective mm. of relocation through scholarships. And even in scholarships, is also a different type of scholarship absolutely which means which means that you have to be able you have to be ready to do the work a lot of because things. it seems like there's a lot of work oh in it. so you're yeah studying and schooling mm, I, I was going to just ask um zeno so if I'm you if somebody is looking today to say i want to take this path i hear you yeah. say that first of all the person must be clear on their plan right so if i've I, if i've decided that it is a scholarship route to oh. go to so how do they begin to search for? Because uh, in fact, they should go to your page. You go and I'm look for it. Just going to say. Yeah. Go, see, this has so research, many things. Your research on I'm my telling page. you. Yeah. You just are never ready. Once I'm ready, I'll come for you. I'll, I'll send you a DM. If there's anything, <laughs> I'd like to even know, give an idea. Of yeah. No, it's not even the cost right now. It's even how to. So what? What are the best places? Because I know you. You always drop those lists. Yeah. Or the best places to start to search from. How do they even? Where so just yeah, research. like in in two minutes, if you can just quickly walk somebody through. I want to move now and I want to go through school and I've decided that, yes, I don't have the money. I want to go through scholarship. What is the first maybe five steps to take? Okay, so the first step to take is for you to decide where you want to study based on your unique situation. These days, many people are going to Canada. Canada is a good country if you are looking to like become um, a, a permanent resident and a citizen fast. Like for me, it took me like four to five years to become a citizen. So if you are looking for funding, you have third class, like any grades, especially people that have low grades, third class, second class, lower, you should be looking at US. 
the opportunities in the US in terms of funding is like a bottomless pit because there are lots of universities there and there's a lot of money in that country. So you should be looking at the US. You want to relocate fast, like, okay, you know, I've given myself like six months. I want to have left this country in six months. Go to UK, but you should hold your money to fund it. So go to UK, you're going to relocate fast. So again, you need to first of all decide where you're going to. Then second, you need to decide how you're going to fund it. It's very important. It comes first before doing any application. How are you going to fund it? If you're going to fund with scholarship, even within funding with scholarship, different scholarship has different ways. Some will tell you, get admission first before you come and apply for the scholarship. But there are certain schools where you must get this admission for you to be eligible to apply for this scholarship. Mm. So it now means that you need to know that, okay, I'm applying for this scholarship. Then you go and check the list of schools there, go and apply for admission in that school, get the admission, come back and apply for the scholarship. Mm. The same thing applies with, to loans. There are um, organizations abroad that give loans, study loans to international students. The way it is where they say if you are a British citizen or if you are a Canadian citizen, you can apply for government loans and you'll be paying small, small. They have those organizations that give to international students where they spread the payment over 10 years. Mm. So even when you're applying for loans, this loan organization, they partner with certain schools too. So you must go and get admission in that school first, come back and apply for the loan. So this process, you need to be able to navigate it. Mm. Then once you have decided that, okay, I, I know the country, I know the, I know how I'm going to fund it, then it's time for you to start looking at the schools. So you start looking for schools. Look for schools that have um, the kind of program that you want to do. So what program do you want to do? I tell people to keep an open mind. Mm. Like, don't restrict yourself to say it must be this program oh, or it must be mm. this country. Mm. So have an open mind. Oh, then, oh. then searching is very important. Somebody may decide that you don't want to do a master's in public health. You go to one school, they call it master's in public health. In another school, they call it master's in epidemiology. Another school, they call it another name. So you must be patient to navigate the website of the university. I tell people, when you land on the website of the university, you need to go to the list of the courses. Don't just go and search for course. Look through the list of courses. Hmm. Look know, through Madam the of opportunities that <laughs> <laughs> you look at all the opportunities. When I was applied to University of Waterloo, yeah. I looked over 1,500 1, wow. scholarships. Every day I would go there and I would check. And that was how I was able to find the opportunities that I applied to. Some wow. of them that I was not eligible at that time. I just put the date in my calendar to say, okay, these dates I'm the going future. to mm. give this application wow. there. Wow. So I did that so I was able to meet up with the time and not forget because you can forget. I didn't want to forget. You know, we, we have to bring you back. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. This is, this is, this is that's what we call it Jackpot series. I knew that we cannot have just one show with you. But thank you so much. We've had a fantastic conversation. I'm telling you, Uti, Uti is smiling here. Even me, I'm like, you know. Are you, are you sure? <laughs> Thank you for staying with us. I hope you enjoyed watching and getting up close and personal with me as much as I enjoyed sharing my time with you. You know, uh, media is a powerful tool and with the ability to sh um, shift the minds of the youths in a progressive trajectory. And I'll continue to do my part two ways. Thank you for watching and supporting Waze, the Waze brand. As we wind down for the year, please let's remember that all we need is love. Love for self, for family, for neighbor, for country, for humanity. And this is me saying, Abalioma. Agamahunu, Ichi, Daluso. Happy holidays. Good night.